On summer Saturdays when I was a kid, my father would take me to the Morgan Arboretum near our house on the island of Montreal to look for salamanders. With jars and nets in tow, we would head down to an old rock quarry surrounded by maples, hemlock, and beech trees, where my love affair with nature began. The quarry had been cut into the side of a small hill, leaving a sheer granite wall overlooking a shallow depression that filled with water in the spring. In the quarry pond teemed the most mysterious and amazing creatures I had ever seen. Large green frog tadpoles with two pairs of legs scattered as I entered the water. Tiny black American toad tadpoles swarmed in the sunshine like a flock of starlings in the fall. Eastern nukes hung just below the water's surface legs dangling and keeled tails slowly moving from side to side. But best of all, blue-spotted salamanders swam in the deep, ending up in my net only if I was very lucky that day. To my young eyes, these strange and beautiful creatures were ambassadors of a world so full of permutations and possibilities that it baffled my imagination and tugged at my heartstrings. Here were animals that, in a single lifetime, could swim and breathe underwater like fish and walk and breathe like me on land. Some, like adult newts, could pick and choose their lifestyle, moving from the water to land and back again depending on local conditions. To top it all off, we now know that salamanders can regrow severed limbs and regenerate parts of their brains and spinal cords, and that they fluoresce green in blue light. I won't even speculate on my childhood reaction to a quarry pond filled with fluorescent salamanders. These incredible creatures shared the island of Montreal with me and my family, and at the time, 1.8 million other people. The island is now home to over 2 million, and I can tell you as of last summer, the frogs, toads, and salamanders are still there, as are a lot of mosquitoes. So how is this possible? 2 million people living side by side with fluorescent salamanders. One of these things just doesn't belong, right? Last year, the World Wildlife Fund published its latest Living Planet Index, showing a staggering 73% average decline in monitored wildlife populations around the globe. This is the world that we live in. We are losing biodiversity very rapidly. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services recently estimated that the global rate of species extinction is at least tens of times higher than the average rate over the last 10 million years, and that millions of species on Earth are at risk of disappearing forever, some within decades. The cause of a lot of this destruction is us. We cut down forests and fill in wetlands to grow food and build houses. We spray pesticides on our lawns and on our crops. We mine minerals and fish the oceans. The byproducts of our activities, chemicals, light, sound, pollute the environment. We pump carbon dioxide into the air, warming it so rapidly that many species can't adapt. Based on this causation, that we are the cause of biodiversity loss, it makes sense to conclude that where humans occur in large numbers, like in cities, other species do not. Cities are our habitat, designed to provide for our needs, which on the face of it are inherently antithetical to non-human survival. Cityscapes, paved and built upon, lawned, teeming with people, can't possibly harbor the wild, fragile creatures that I fell in love with as a child. 
and that rely on untamed places to survive. But wait, I'm still looking for salamanders where I live, and I'm finding them in the most human-dominated places, places where they shouldn't be. Places like a stream draining a major business district, the kind with the ominous algae, silt-covered rocks, and overall sludgy appearance that makes me wash my hands as soon as I get home. Places like an ephemeral wetland fed by runoff from a parking garage on campus, and those salamanders were humongous. Um, and I just learned of a salamander species listed as endangered in Tennessee that happily lays its eggs on the plastic bags and cinder blocks it finds in some of the state's most urban streams. I'm also finding all kinds of other species hiding in plain sight. I've seen coyote, deer, fox, opossum, raccoons, box turtles, brown snakes, black snakes, barred owls, great horned owls, red-shouldered hawks, cooper's hawks, red-tailed hawks, Mississippi kites, and peregrine falcons in my urban neighborhood. North American river otters frolic in a restored stream near uptown Charlotte and in stormwater ponds in the suburbs. I've seen flocks of red-headed woodpeckers and bobolinks, species that have declined by half since the 1960s, in street trees. Native yellow passionflower vine, the only nectar source for the tiny black passionflower bee, grows rampant behind my garage. And I once came across a luna moth on the sidewalk one of 899 moth species in my county, the most urban county in the ninth most populous state in the third most populous country on Earth. This is just my experience, but many other urban ecologists around the world are also finding that cities are brimming with biodiversity. A recent analysis of the birds and plants in 147 cities around the world found that the sampled cities were home to 2,041 bird species, about one-fifth of Earth's total avian diversity, and 14,240 plant species. These numbers include 36 bird and 65 plant species threatened with global extinction. Back in the US, all urban areas with more than 50,000 people, so basically where nearly every American lives, contain one or more bird species listed as endangered or threatened by state governments, and 82% of those urban areas contain one or more federally listed species. These are species that are presumably the most sensitive to human activities. And finally, in Zurich, over 100 herbaceous plant species were found in the city's smallest green areas, the kind of tiny spaces that we all pass by every day without a glance. So cities are where people and a dazzling array of other species coexist. But this runs counter to what we understand based, based on what we know about biodiversity loss, and further, what we've been taught about the separation between humans and nature. In other words, that we don't mix. So an important question is then, why are cities so rich in wildlife? It could be because until recently, cities have been ignored by ecologists. Urban ecology is a very young science, and so we're just finding lots of species because we've just started looking. It could be because cities are becoming more wildlife friendly, with more greenways and street trees in places that were once paved over. This and reasons like changing land use patterns and climate change might make resource-rich cities more attractive to wildlife 
like coyotes. For some species, it could be because we've stopped hunting, trapping, or poisoning them, leading to their populations rebounding, and they are choosing what they perceive to be perfectly good habitat, like bald eagles nesting near human-made lakes in Charlotte or along the shores of the city of Toronto. Or for some species, it could be because they're adapting to the pressures of city life like urban crested anole lizards with longer toe pads that help them cling to the glass and concrete of their surroundings. These are all plausible explanations that deserve more attention from scientists. What is clear is that we, who live in cities, are part of vibrant urban ecosystems. Ecosystems that link us other species, and the water, air, and minerals that we all need to survive. Just like in any other type of ecosystem on the planet, all of the processes that accompany life on Earth, photosynthesis, decomposition, nutrient cycling, predation, herbivory, are happening all around us every moment of every day. Given that we are right now surrounded by and participating in a complex ecosystem with a wealth of other species, it strikes me that nature is not absent from cities, but that we are. We are oblivious to the birds, bats, mammals, amphibians, reptile, fungi, plants, photosynthesis, decomposition, nutrient cycling, predation, and herbivory that we live amongst. Our cities, neighborhoods, and yards are full of nature in all its glory, but we don't realize it's there. I think of this phenomenon as what might happen in a marriage heading towards divorce. Humanity has been in a relationship with nature for a very long time. It's been a rocky one, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But lately, humanity has been spending a lot of time alone in places where nature is not welcome. Humanity has checked out of the relationship. Humanity has spent so much time away from nature that we've forgotten what nature is like and why we got into the relationship in the first place. Nature is a stranger to us. One statistic that I've come across makes this crystal clear. The Bird Buddies program in the UK was created to test the effectiveness of watching and feeding birds on kids' environmental knowledge and attitudes. After six weeks of watching and feeding birds, 80% of seven to 10-year-olds thought that the act of feeding birds increase the number of bird species visiting their schoolyards. However, pre and post program expert monitoring showed that this was not the case. The number of birds visiting schoolyards did not change at all. In effect, many birds were invisible to these kids until the kids started learning about them and interacting with them. In other words, the birds were there, but the kids couldn't see them. Nature is still willing to give the relationship a try if we are. She's been by our side through thick and thin. She's not going anywhere unless we choose to abandon her, but we won't do that. There are three things that you can do to rekindle your relationship with nature today. First, find a non-human neighbor. In your yard, along the sidewalk, in your park, that is preferably maybe not a coyote. <laughs> Second, get to know your new neighbor, what they look like, where they live, who their friends are, what they like to do with their time. An app like iNaturalist can help with this. And third, 
repeat. If you do this, you will find a world of wonder at your doorstep, and maybe even a few fluorescent salamanders. And that world and the fluorescent salamanders in it will be worthy of your love. Thank you. <laughs>